My name is Ignacio Olmos and I am the Executive Director of Instituto Cervantes here in New York. Instituto Cervantes is extremely proud to present this event tonight together with the Sustainable Development Goals Fund, United Nations Development Program, Cooperación Española and the Fundación Universidad Rey Juan Carlos. In the equation 15I, I stands for ideas, imagination, inspiration, but also for innovation, inclusion, and interaction. Through this new forum, the recently created UN Sustainable Development Goals Fund and Instituto Cervantes want to create an open and equal platform in which specialists, professionals, activists, entrepreneurs, and academics around the world gather and share their be best ideas and experiences. 15i dialogues are organized as a set of interactive dialogues where attendees, both face-to-face -face or virtual, can engage in the topics discussed by submitting questions and posting their comments. In this first dialogue, we have a series of development experts who will share their expertise and thoughts on the theme of new actors, new challenges. We would like to thank our speakers, Bruno Moro, Daniel Rondi, Jeffrey Hafines, and Annette Richardson for taking the time to share with us this evening. We are also extremely grateful for the contribution of David Ito Carrasco, who is the director of Tombo Productions and producer of humanitarian and development aid documentaries. David Ito will be moderating the dialogue this evening and also contributing by sharing his own thoughts on engaging communities, governments, and citizens with the challenges posed by this new development landscape. I would especially like to thank Paloma Duran, Senior Advisor of United, States, United Nations Development Program, for taking the initiative and being responsible for the success of this first event. She couldn't attend this evening because of, because of a previous commitment in Madrid, but representing, representing her tonight is Raúl de Mora, whom I would like to thank for his invaluable support. And I would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you Anna Vázquez, our new cultural director who joined us last week. She has a great experience throughout various Instituto Cervantes centers around the, world, around the world and will be the person responsible for public and cultural programs from now on. Welcome, Anna, to Instituto Cervantes New York. And finally, we thank you once again for coming this evening, and I sincerely hope you enjoy this first dialogue within the 15i series. Thank you very much. So good evening. Um, I'd also like to welcome you all tonight um, to tonight's forum. And this, as you know, is the kickstart of the 15i dialogue. Um, so I will be moderating tonight's forum. And as you know, the MDG Achievement Fund ran from 2007 to 2013, supporting 130 programs in 50 countries. In 2014, the government of Spain and UNDP created a new development cooperation mechanism called the Sustainable Development Goals Fund. Um, this fund builds on the experience, knowledge, and lessons learned of the previous MDG Achievement Fund, and it places an even greater focus on sustainable development, highlight the sustainable part. So as the post-2015 agenda evolves, the 15i dialogues aim to create a space for open discussion and idea generation that contributes to the transition from MDGs to SDGs. Um, this first dialogue will set the stage for future dialogues on how to achieve greater gender equality, environmental sustainability, reducing inequalities and using the worldview of indigenous peoples to better understand development challenges. So as these dialogues, as tonight, are based on open and equal interaction, there will be a space for dialogue 
and questions following our speakers this evening. And we highly encourage you all to participate with questions, comments, and suggestions, experiences. Um, we also encourage you to share your thoughts and questions using the hashtag 15i Dialogues through the SDGF's Twitter and by participating in debates uh, on the SDGF and Instituto Cervantes websites. So now I would like to introduce our first speaker this evening, Mr. Bruno Moro, and he is the director of the Sustainable Development Goals Fund. He has over 30 years experience with the United Nations, and he will share with us tonight how he believes development cooperation is changing and the initiatives which he has seen to be effective in addressing development challenges. Well, many thank you for uh, uh, this opportunity. Thanks to the Instituto Cervantes, the second time I, I'm here, the first time was uh, fantastic. We have the Playing for Change band here uh, singing for us in this setting at night. So really beautiful and unique to stay here. And I appreciate, again, this invitation, the opportunity to, to talk in this audience. Now, <coughs> starting the conversation is same, always a handicap, you know, because the other will be inspired while we talk. <laughs> you know, and, they, and this time of the day, I feel um, kind of uh, um, in, in a, in a with your presence in a challenge in, in saying something really relevant. But uh, um, I would like to talk briefly and try to concentrate uh, some of the concepts that uh, uh, I gather with uh, my experience. And after 30 years, maybe it's time to find another, another type of experience just to enrich my life and not to be uh, kind of uh, have this uh, UN uh, uh, sign over me all only. But uh, <coughs> why I'm saying that? Because when uh, the title of this, when we have the title of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, dialogue among us is uh, the future development cooperation. Uh, I tend to think of the future of the UN in the context of this development cooperation. Actually, development cooperation is wider than that. Uh, so I will mix the two because I think that there will be, uh, there are connection. Uh, development cooperation is, uh, is development cooperation, it's not the UN development cooperation. Of course, UN has specific role of which I am proud. I was joking about the need to to, to find something, some, some, something else uh, uh, to enrich my life as I retire in a few days. But, uh, but uh, and I'm very proud that I've been working with the United Nations in this sense. Uh, um, definitely, uh, there is a future for development cooperation, but uh, we have to be aware uh, that uh, uh, important changes will come to, to, toward us, and then we, we will have to work in adaptation. Actually, I think that so many important changes have happened uh, in the recent years that we have been changing continuously without really realizing. There are some subtle changes that are coming and all of a sudden they transform all, all over us. I would like just to make a very brief uh, uh, presentation uh, or, or we're just uh, uh, going through briefly on, on how uh, we, we, we experience uh, uh, dramatic change development cooperation although not so much in our structure, but the way we were working really changed. For example, let's say the important elements, uh, uh, they are ki kind of a milestone in change in development cooperation. Uh, I start in the 80s. Uh, in the 80s uh, with the UN, uh, we lived the end of the first, uh, in my opinion, wave of development cooperation. We started at the end of the, world, uh, the Second World War. It was still conceived as a system, comprehensive system, with a kind of global covenant where development has had an important role in promoting peace and security because between the two wars, the lack of development, because the peace was a punitive one, created a tension in the global system and uh, created another war. After the Second World War, really, there was a tremendous wisdom among the leadership uh, uh, global leadership, and they thought we had to get global agreement to change the way we work. So from the part of the, uh, from, 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 from the UN side, uh, the, the conception was we need a, a political system or a system that address political uh, conflict, but at the same time development and also trade. So we have 
the secretary, we had development system with the agencies, and the, the moment to establish the uh, trade system, that already the post-war system, the uh, collaboration was less obvious, so it remained pending until, until the end of the 80s. But uh, what was the system uh, in, in the 80s? Was, uh, UNDP was the central funding agencies, and it received the funds to distribute the funds to other agencies according to planning, five-year planning exercise. It was kind of the, the traditional planning thing. In the, at the end of the 80s, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, really it changed completely the world. Uh, one of the consequences for the development was, first, first of all, that in few years the foreign direct investment was 100 times, 200 times, 300 percent more than development cooperation. So all of a sudden our relevance, the UN, but in general, was really uh, unbalanced of, uh, from, uh, because of this new uh, new uh, uh, factor. So we were not important so much for the resources, but for something else. And maybe we didn't realize that something else is to, to provide a standard setting, uh, to provide a, a, a right approach, uh, to provide a kind of uh, global monitoring that they, they, that they were un not unbalancing. So a specific role that uh, we still have to adjust, actually. And, 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 but we did it. You remember that the, the whole decade of the 90 was the big conferences of the UN. The uh, Rio conference, on the Cairo conference on population, then we had a conference on uh, Beijing. On the so we were setting, so the system after the, the collapse and, and the new global system, uh, uh, we were uh, finding the way to set global agreements and only under the UN this global agreement could be set because the UN uh, promoted a, a platform for discussion that was neutral and so on and so forth. Of course, World Bank changed and so on and so forth, other things. Uh, uh, everybody changes in its own way, but, but essentially the global setting was, well, actually 90 was also a, a period of, 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 of uh, disagreements among the, the population. Remember that uh, the UN had a lot of discussion with the bank for concern, the structural adjustment policy. The structural adjustment policy had something good because it promoted a, 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 a discipline of, of budget uh, equilibrium, particularly in Latin America that, you know, 300% of uh, inflation so on and so forth, but at the same time debilitated the capacity of the state to support uh, uh, development in a certain sense because it reduced a cut by half the capacity of the state and it was not picked up. So from that moment, maybe the phenomenon of inequality in the America, Latin America started to become almost radical, very complex, very difficult. Uh, also in the, in the uh, 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 in the 90s, uh, uh, we, 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 we uh, have also the, the starting the, the presence of the civil society. So, uh, the presence of the civil society as a as a factor that uh, before was not so 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 active. We, we are dealing essentially with government. And still, we have this issue. We are an intergovernmental uh, organization now, but we cannot think of working without civil society. And the issue becomes now uh, a little bit complicated because essentially we are intergovernmental. When we go to the country, we discuss with government, but we don't discuss with civil society. We lose some some of the credibility. Essentially, the, <coughs> the cacophony of the 90s led to the MDGs because we needed to, sto to talk with the same language. We were a completely different discussion when uh, UN, IFI, bilateral cooperation, European Union, they were talking they're different. Uh, they were, uh, instead of helping the government, we are creating a problem to the government. We are massive necessity of having counterpart with the government, so taking too much of their time for different things. So the revolution of MDGs that reduced the overall uh, uh, objective, a discussion around development on, on the eight MDGs, Millennium Development Goal. And it was fantastic. It was an incredible revolution. The Millennium Development was a really a millennium. It has the strength of the millennium, the secular uh, de declaration that is uh, being implemented less than half, so, so secular it is. No? But it's valid also for the SDGs. It's a, it's a beautiful documentation. And uh, uh, being able to uh, concentrate on the eight uh, objectives uh, for goals was fantastic. 
what uh, uh, was missed is the how to do it and uh, who uh, and, and uh, compared to the previous phase and who was doing what in which sense. For example, the Monterrey, which was the uh, s uh, conference, which was the, w the following year of, of the of the of the MDGs adoption, was supposed to indicate the funding for. Uh, so uh, uh, in that moment, there was an agreement. There were indications that we should increase from 0.7 up to 1% the, uh, the funding for development cooperation, but actually it was not, the agreement was not there. There were a lot of other agreements, there were a lot of other normative indication, but concretely there was no funding for the MDG. So if you agree on development objective and you don't put money to m be accepted, to advocate, to promote, to create a everywhere a s funding source for experimenting on this new uh, area of development, you leave it to the goodwill of everybody else, of the countries alone. You leave the country alone. They have their own problems. So this was a little bit the shortcoming in this period. But at the same time, the benefit was that everybody was there and everybody, the development cooperation, including not only UN, all the rest, had the same language. And uh, it simplified and facilitated uh, the concentration of the resources that we had. And we discovered that resources for development are not only UN and not only the people that work on development. They, they are important because they, uh, they sign and, and they indicate the path to follow. And if it is well done, the national policy will, uh, will, will come out. So uh, uh, the, the mid, uh, the, uh, this MEDG era will, ch will change forever the way we do cooperation. And, and we see that, that we're going to the SDG. We, we follow a little bit the pattern. And there was a great discussion on agreements on, on what to do. The issue is always there. While we uh, uh, realize that we, for us, that, and when I think of the future, that we, we the importance of uh, having <coughs> the UN, having uh, agency to work in standard setting and so on and so forth, and the relevance for the future of humanity of having this type of organization or structure um, that has a specific role jointly to others, and at the same time, we see that we have a reduction of the, of the funding for, for these institutions. Th then you ask yourself what is really happening here. Because uh, uh, th the issue is uh, maybe we should think a more drastic way of rethinking our role in this process. Uh, at, at this stage, I'm asking myself, because I, I perceive we have done a lot of good exercises. I work in Colombia. There are. Uh, where Mr. De La Mora, the Miss De La Mora was here, that was also in Colombia, that where the UN uh, uh, really promoted uh, that, that process of, of, of providing uh, a standard setting, motivation, uh, right approach, and so on and so forth, and showing the national counterpart on how to address this, and above all, being kind of the advocate or the ambassador of what is a global uh, feeling or global expectation for were concerned uh, elements like uh, participation, democracy, inclusion, and so on and so forth. The MDGs left something uh, out, of course, couldn't be otherwise, but, uh, uh, but th that is interesting to see uh, what was left out uh, and, and, and what is changing with the SDG. First of all, you remember the MDG was famous for uh, reduced by half. Uh, and so uh, people were thinking, uh, what happened to the other half? Uh, so this time the global uh, wisdom is no, leave no one behind. This is a beautiful sentence. So this really is, is, is catching almost everything. Uh, leave no one behind. And in, in spite of the differences, we are one world, uh, different creeds, different thought, different culture, but, diff but the same uh, aspiration. The other issue that was uh, not uh, perceived properly was uh, the issue of, uh, of um, the, the impact of the environment. First, the environment was, uh, was uh, considered like something where okay, you have to be careful. But now we have a, a situation where you have to uh, not to do like the French and the, and the, and, and the e British during the uh, at the beginning of the Second World War, there were appeasement with the aggression of the Nazi. We do should be appeasement with the degradation. We should really combat it more forcefully because now we're in a situation that almost we of, of non-return 
and is no return is really a, 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 a difficult issue. Another thing that uh, was not expected was the uh, capacity of resilience of the en entrenchment of the extreme poverty. Really, the MDG didn't affect the extreme poverty, didn't impact it properly, the extreme poverty, they are still there. So, uh, and, and the l uh, strangely enough, extreme poverty is where uh, you have countries that have improved and now are not, uh, the north-south divide is changing. Uh, they are, they are growing more than advanced industrialized country. We have example in Africa now, the, the <laughs> fastest growing uh, uh, continent, Latin America until recently. So in rich, middle income, high middle income, we have uh, among the worst of the, of the, of the so it is a phenomenon that, that we have to see. And uh, the demographic issue is also something that will impact uh, absolutely because we have the pyramid which is inversed in certain parts of the world much, than uh, ma ma much more than other and almost uh, complementary. So Europeans should live with African because there are a lot of youth there and a lot of uh, all these people <laughs> in the European country. And that's why maybe we have this migration in the Mediterranean. That's so, so this is an element that's tragically human and we need to do something for that. So the of course, we see that, uh, that uh, uh, one of the element of the five uh, uh, driving elements of the, of the SDG is job creation. I remember when I started the, my career, uh, the principal issue was job creation. I'm ending the career, job creation is still there. So this is something which is really uh, is the capacity of uh, derailment of society that we can see. Uh, the, the funny things that I have is reading Paul Krugman in New York Times against the uh, uh, deflatory uh, policy uh, that we have in Europe, and that's why we 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 don't uh, uh, in Europe we don't uh, promote job and and how and the other side the res the, the response to Grufman on the other side was a very interesting debate. You know how we promote job uh, creation is something that uh, is uh, tragic uh, because it's uh, it's uh, it's one of the issues that created uh, uh, that created the conflict in the past was access on job. One of the issues is creating a new sort of conflict, which is the explosion of the, uh, and I'm finishing now, so, so don't be worried that uh, uh, as a good Italian after I warm up, I, I <laughs> tend to, no, but, but I will, uh, 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 of, the, of the organized crime. The organized crime become, is, is really capturing part of the states in an unusual way, and is becoming a structural impediment for everything for democracy, for uh, normal living, societal living. So this is an issue that, uh, that uh, we, we hadn't, have not foreseen, the importance of development, uh, uh, of, of job creation for, 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 for the future. And um, so I, I, I think that uh, we have to think of ourselves, okay, we have less money, but we have more responsibility, how we do that. Definitely we will need to have a, a rethinking. We, I hope that, uh, it will not be done, uh, this rethinking, because the reality will impose us with tragedy and catastrophes, but because we will be able for the ta first time in, in, in human history to, to first see that things are coming, and they will be able to set and put in motion uh, action that will uh, prevent a uh, difficult time for, 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 for us, for humanity, to to uh, in the future. And I speak now not of, of, of poor country, not of, of uh, develop, uh, country, developing country because this category are being washed away somehow. It's, it's now a discussion about humanity because these phenomena are impacting everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bruno, for sharing with us today. Um, I'll introduce now uh, Mr. Daniel Rundy, who is the director of the Project on Prosperity and Development, and William A. Schreyer, Chair in Global Analysis at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He will be discussing the new challenges in the context of historical and political approaches and the changed priorities and actors in contemporary societies. All in 10 minutes or less. Can <laughs> I can do it. Thanks for having me. It's a real privilege to be here. Uh, I'm a beneficiary of Spanish capacity building. I lived in 
Granada, Spain for a year, and so I have an enduring love affair with the country of Spain, and so it's really a privilege to be here, and um, I uh, want to also recognize the important contribution of Spanish development cooperation. Spain is a, uh, has been a country that you know, has experienced development, but is also now a major donor and is recognized as such, and so has a lot to contribute to the global conversation. This is the one of the many ways in which it's doing so, so thank you for doing this. Um, the, I want to just, I want to first start with, um, if you look ahead, there is going to be a little bit on what Bruno was saying, that there is going to be a, uh, a lot of potential for reduction in poverty in the, in, over the next 15 to 20 years. And if you look back, I want to talk a little bit about what's changed in the last 15 or 20 years. But there is a, you know, there's a, there's a world out there of increased prosperity and there's, uh, in, and so development cooperation has a role to play in it. It just has to change because the world has changed and the dynamics have changed. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, so f first, I want to recognize that the process of the Sustainable Development Goals, and if you read the high-level panel report and the response by the Secretary General um, and uh, the other documents as part of this very long and laborious process, recognizes the changed world that we're in um, from 15 years ago when these were first uh, written about written up um, one is there there's an in increased emphasis some in some ways going back full circle as Bruno said to uh, job creation uh, uh, there's a there's a conversation in the in the discussion of the SDGs around governance uh, rule of law, there's been some issues around the phrase rule of law, but uh, the idea is there's a recognition that governance is an important part of development. Um, and so I, I think there's been, uh, and if you look at the change in resource flows, again, something Bruno was talking about, if you look, I'll use the U.S. as a context, in the 1960s, something like 70 percent of resources from the United States, the developing world, was foreign aid, was ODA. And 30% was foreign direct investment, remittances, and private philanthropy. Today, 10% of less than 10% of the resources from the United States to the developing world is ODA. And it's 90% foreign direct investment, philanthropy, remittances. Now, the audience might say, well, that's because the United States is stingy and they're not very generous, but I would argue that it's a far larger pie. There's actually was a tripling of ODA in the United States from the year 2000 to the year 2010. The Bush administration um, tripled foreign assistance. It was, assistance. It was the largest uh, increase in foreign assistance in the United States history since the Truman administration, since the launch of the Marshall Plan and built upon by uh, and followed on by the Obama administration. So it's been a bipartisan phenomenon. Um, and so I think it's not a question of, of ODA. It's just that, that globalization has happened. And if you look at Europe or you look at other OECD traditional donors, I would argue that that, that same change in the economic makeup has, has happened. I've been traveling. I spent a lot of time on airplanes. I've been uh, to a number of different countries in the last uh, three or four months. I spent a lot of time talking to foreign ministries and aid ministries. Um, I was uh, with the African Development Bank's board of directors last week in Abidjan and spent an hour with them. And they have produced some very interesting studies um, just, some, just some additional things about the way the world has changed. In the year 2007 in Africa, uh, remittances surpassed foreign aid as a resource flow in Africa. In the year 2012, foreign direct investment surpassed foreign aid in Africa. So even in the, mo even in the continent that continues to have some of the most challenges of global poverty, these other forces have, in essence, caught up. I do not believe that you're going to see some radical change in that makeup anytime soon, unless you tell me that there's going to be a cutting in half of global migration and half of the Africans in the diaspora to come home or, um, or in the foreign direct investment of whether, now, okay, it's, it's uneven. Uh, it's, uh, and then the other data point is in the year 2000, there were, and this is, some, this is I think it's either UNCTAD or it's another UN agency, there was $100 billion of what's called domestic resource mobilization in Africa, compared to about 30 or $40 billion in foreign aid going into Africa in the year 2000. By the year 2010, it was something like domestic resource mobilization, which is in essence taxes and fees collected by governments in Africa, 
was $400 billion compared to $60 billion of foreign aid. So what I'm saying is, is that there are these other forces in some, in some countries, many countries, an increasing number of countries, even in Africa, there are these other actors that, it's, that are changing the game. And we have to, as official donors, have to move off of thinking they're the largest wallet in the room. And they have to th rethink their role in this changed world. Um, obviously, there are a whole other series of changes. We could talk about global aging. But the other thing I want to also reference is middle-income countries. What happens, um, I was at, among one, one of the other places I was at in the last uh, two weeks, I was in New Hampshire for the 70th anniversary of the signing of the Bretton Woods Accords, right, which were the, uh, in essence, the treaty to uh, kick off the IMF and the World Bank, uh, launched by what was described by Franklin Roosevelt as the United Nations in 1944. And, and so this was the 70th anniversary of the signing of that. Um, and um, development, there were two strands. It wasn't just reconstruction. A lot of the conversation around the World Bank is about the World Bank was set up to rebuild Europe. But many of the stakeholders that were there, many, there was a very large representation from Latin America in 1944. They were speaking about development. They wanted to have development. There was a whole, you know, there were uh, representation from Asia and from Africa at that conference in 1944. So, um, development has has been there for a long time and so it's it's just development's going to have to change in this changed context that I've just been describing um, let me just suggest some ways in which ODA is going to foreign aid is going to matter or development assistance or development cooperation is going to matter in the future in this in this changed environment uh, there are I mean I've worked with a lot of philanthropy in the last 15 years of my career I've worked with I've worked at a, a commercial bank, doing commercial banking. I've worked in investment banking. I've worked at a bilateral donor, and I've worked at the World Bank Group. And I can tell you that um, I'm all for globalization. I'm all for free markets, um, and I'm for in democracy promotion. But there are certain things that ODA can do, even in this changed world. So let me just suggest some, some of the following. Some are going to be things like anti-corruption, supporting anti-corruption initiatives democracy promotion, things like supporting and responding to emergency response and conflict. Uh, I also think in this world of increased domestic resource mobilization, you hear it at all the international conferences, this phrase domestic resource mobilization, we need to use uh, ODA for capacity building and public financial management because that's actually going to be far more important as well as supporting the civil society that's going to hold governments accountable. The, if, we, if we can't get dem democratically accountable governments, which is where my bias is, then at least we want to have accountable governance, which I think is sort of the more politically correct term we use in the, the, the international, you know, sometimes in international systems. I think that's sort of reflected in the, the language of the high level panel. They don't say, come out and say, we want democratic accountability, but they, you, they come up right to the line, and, and there was, a, and, and I think it's, it's well done. I think that's where the bias is, but they don't come out and say it. And that, that's good, but that's fine. And then I think there's also roles for there you go, democratic accountable institutions. So, but governance, paying for and funding and supporting improvements in government governance, governance, as well as supporting and improving investment climate. There are other things as well, but I would just posit that we're gonna have to rethink our size and our role in this changed world. We're gonna have to partner with others. And many countries are gonna be able to finance their own development. Uh, and then finally, let me just leave one minute uh, for the special case of what I would ca characterize as middle-income countries. I know this is a, something that the, the country of Spain thinks about in its cooperation, when it thinks about the Maghreb, its new plan director talks, it focuses on Central America and it focuses on the Maghreb. These are regions with middle-income countries. I think it, the original rationale for development cooperation 50 years ago was about extreme poverty in the poorest of countries. What happens when you're working in countries that have starter foreign aid programs, that have sovereign wealth funds, that have the ability to finance a lot of their own development? We have to rethink the concept of cooperation in this change. It doesn't mean we have to disengage. It just means we have to rethink our, our, our mindset in this changed world. Um, I also think it's going to have implications for the, the, the old model of we have to get to 0.7%. Now, I know a lot of activists are going to say, oh, no, this is really important. But I think that as we move from 
uh, aid effectiveness in, in, to development effectiveness through the Paris Accra Busan Global Partnership conversation, I think you're going to see that you'll see it continue rhetorical pointing towards that goal. But I think that is going to disappear as a, I think over time that's going to dilute. And so we don't have to like it, but I think that that is, I think, I think that's, that is going to go away over time. And I think instead we're going to have to rethink what our value add is and what our relevance is in this changed world. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, who, um, whose name is Jeffrey Huffines, who comes to us from Civicus and will now describe how civil society is evolving as a partner in development and what role civil society may play in the post-2015 agenda. Thank you very much. Well, I'm delighted to be here to join this uh, illustrious panel. And um, I'm going to focus my remarks on the outcome and results of uh, an annual UN uh, civil society conference that took place uh, at the end of August. Um, this was the 65th annual UN DPI NGO conference. And the theme of the conference was 2015 Beyond Our Action Agenda. And at this conference, we had some over 2,000 NGO delegates and from uh, some 700 NGOs in over 100 countries. So this is one of the uh, largest premier annual civil society conferences. And we took this as an opportunity to take a look at um, the role of civil society in the post-2015 development agenda, recognizing that 2015 is is perhaps a once-in-a-generation opportunity for change, and, and now is the time for us to prepare for it. Uh, the conference it was, is an uh, important milestone ahead of the Secretary General's 2014 Climate Summit taking place in the next uh, couple of weeks, and, and also it, it was a moment for civil society to pause and reflect and refine our advocacy strategies going forward as member states return to the General Assembly to begin the negotiations of the post-2015 development agenda. Um, 2015, a year from now, uh, there will be the, um, uh, the summit, uh, the post-2015 development summit, which will be followed by the UNFCCC COP21 in Paris. So all of these together uh, represent an opportunity to shape the future of our peoples and the planet for the better. One of the main outcomes of this conference was a uh, outcome document that consists of a conference declaration of some 16 pages and a res resource document of uh, 37 pages. And so this was an opportunity for civil society activists and NGO experts to come together and uh, review the, con the emerging consensus of civil society in this uh, in the development of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, in, the, in their um, participation in the Open Working Group during this past year and a half. And so I want to take a look at this, uh, this outcome document in the context of three key lessons learned from the MDGs that have fundamentally shaped the negotiations of the SDGs going forward. Uh, Whereas the MDGs were uh, rather exclusively focused on the social dimension of sustainable development, uh, with the exception of uh, a rather weak uh, MDG on environmental sustainability, this new set of development goals will seek to integrate on a more equal basis the three dimensions of sustainable development and will be univers universally applicable. And so the question is, how will this applicability uh, take place uh, across all countries. And uh, also, whereas the MDGs were decided by the UN Secretariat without the inputs of member states and other stakeholders, we've, during this, you know, since Rio plus 20, we've been engaged in an exhaustive process of consultations, some 100 national consultations, 11 thematic consultations. Um, and so, um, we recognize now we're at a point where the negotiations will begin, and the question remains, how will all stakeholders engage 
in the implementation of the post-2015 development agenda and also in its review. Now, w one thing that was very clear, I think, to all of us is that the, N uh, the SDGs will not be achieved without a robust means of implementation that go beyond the traditional donor beneficiary paradigm uh, and needs to be coupled with a truly meaningful and revitalized global partnership for sustainable development to replace uh, MDG 8. Equally essential will be monitoring and accountability frameworks deeply rooted in human rights norms, standards, and mechanisms at all levels of decision making to be supported by the establishment uh, of the High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, which is a unique hybrid mechanism that operates under the auspices of the General Assembly and ECOSOC. Uh, in the negotiations of the High Level Political Forum, uh, on the one hand, civil society was very pleased that, uh, at least in principle, civil society and uh, other stakeholders have some of the strongest participation rights uh, in the intergovernmental process. And yet, the question still remains, uh, in what? In other words, what is uh, what will this high-level political forum, how will it operate uh, in practice? Um, regarding this conference declaration itself, it, it offers not only a critique of the status quo, but also offers a vision of the kind of world we want to live in by 2030. Uh, so, for example, it states, we declare that our vision for the post-2015 development agenda is that of an inclusive and sustainable world where every person is safe, resilient, lives well, and enjoys their human rights, and where political and economic systems deliver well-being for all people within the limits of our planet's resources. Consequently, it is a world where all human rights are realized, inequalities have been properly addressed and remedied, and with poverty having been eradicated. The health of our planet, its natural resources, and the environment are treasured and safeguarded where there is social justice and where peace, safety, and human security are a reality for all, including refugees and people displaced by human-induced and natural disasters. Now, one of the things that we, that we recognize and, and one of the points of uh, discussion during this conference was the importance of monitoring and accountability and the importance of robust means of implementation as being instrumental in the achievement of these sustainable development goals. And in this regard, civil society, we all agreed that rigorous human rights-based accountability systems based on compulsory, report compulsory reporting must be established at both the domestic and international levels as part of an effective system of accountability. And again, within the context of the UN system, this high-level political forum, which, is which has replaced the Commission on Sustainable Development, is very key. And yet, our concern is that whereas the HLPF will be the home of the SDGs to review its functions, to identify emerging issues, and set the agenda, it's been charged with a very heavy agenda, and yet it needs an independent and strong position within the UN hierarchy. It needs to be more than just a Davos-style talk shop that, that meets eight days uh, uh, every year. We're concerned that the HLPF lacks a bureau, um, and, that, uh, and also we're concerned that it must be given the resources and responsibility to actually um, uh, fulfill its uh, mandate, which is to integrate the three dimensions of sustainable development across the UN system, not only in terms of policy or thematically, but institutionally and in terms of, of governance. So uh, on the issue of partnerships, I'll segue right into your, <laughs> <laughs> uh, w this was also a topic of, um, of, of high concern in, in the um, conference. And on the one hand, there was a recognition that adopting a transformative vision for sustainable human development and translating it from policy to reality requires substantial institutional shifts and accountable and transparent new partnerships. 
and there was a reaffirmation that multi-stakeholder partnerships between all levels of government, civil society, diaspora communities, academia, the private sector, and the philanthropic community would be essential towards implementation of the post-2015 development agenda, and thus should be empowered. However, at the same time, there was key concern that with regard to the global partnership for sustainable development, that its meaning should not be distorted into the notion of just partnerships in the plural. That is to say, the global partnership for sustainable development is one that is principally between governments of developed and developing countries, with the developed countries taking the lead in providing resources and the means of implementation, and that a genuine and balanced global partnership would enable people and institutions to monitor the common but differentiated responsibilities of all actors to prohibit rather than perpetuate global obstacles. There's quite a bit in the declaration and the resource document of poli policy prescriptions that uh, speak to the economic order as a whole and uh, the importance of developing a more equitable model uh, where, whereby um, the, the means of prosperity are allocated to, to those of us who um, are in the greatest need, the most vulnerable. And so there's a recognition that human rights norms that uh, it, it is essential and that if we're going to develop an accountability mechanism, it must incorporate explicitly the human rights obligations that m most member states have already uh, um, legally recognized. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Annette Richardson who comes to us today from the UN Office for Partnerships, and she will speak about the active role that the private, private sector is currently having, currently taking towards achieving inclusive and sustainable development. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, uh, I, I, I'm privileged to be here. Thank you so much for welcoming us tonight in your beautiful home. Um, and I'm a bit of the opposite of Bruno. I've been in the UN now for three years and uh, disrupting it quite a bit. Uh, uh, I come from the private sector, and so I have a, a very non-UN perspective on, uh, on global issues. And perhaps that is the metric, uh, is to uh, I've been able to facilitate a number of dialogue with the private sector and the UN in a much more, uh, perhaps in a naive way, but but building uh, interesting dialogue between the two uh, still very distinct world. Uh, the Partnership Office uh, is an office of the uh, UN Secretariat, so we report to the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General on matters, on partnership matters. And that is, um, we were created, before I go into a little bit deeper into that, we were created at, as a result of Ted Turner's uh, $1 billion gift to the UN, which was an extraordinary gift made by an individual and a gift that has not been replicated to date. Uh, he still remains the uh, one and only private individual to have given so much out of his personal bank account into the UN system at large. Um, that was back in 1998. Today we've dispersed about 1.3 billion of Ted's uh, money and uh, uh, we've dispersed it very uh, openly and uh, particularly in climate and health areas. And we continue to uh, search for the next Ted Turner, obviously. But we've diversified a little bit our reach. Uh, uh, when I was brought in three years ago was to really focus on the, on the private sector uh, outreach. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, uh, I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember that the uh, 70, 80s and certainly perhaps 90s were an NGO movement, was a civil society movement. Uh, for global development. I think we've entered a very interesting new era, although it's a very beginning, but I believe that the private sector is going to play 
a very substantive role into global development. Although we are in the very early stages of it, uh, you know, the market is going to um, take on uh, some of the responsibility um, in, in global development. Now, that said, uh, if the UN, my position is if the UN is setting the agenda for global development, then the UN should be accompanying the private sector into that, uh, that, that work. Uh, there's a little bit of tension, obviously. Uh, you have, on one hand, a very political institution, and on the other, uh, capital-based uh, 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 companies. And so the tension is good, but the tension needs to be uh, uh, worked on and massaged, and, and there needs to be open dialogue. Uh, the UN needs to meet with the private sector, the private s sector needs to meet with the UN and find ways to, uh, to work together. It's what I called, and I always tell Raul, it's kind of the UN 2.0. And so we find areas within the UN, um, areas of innovation where we can actually drive the private sector to invest and partner with the UN in, uh, in very, very innovative ways. Uh, UNICEF, for example, has an, uh, uh, a big innovation, uh, not so big, but, but pretty important innovation hub uh, where the private sector now is, is actually partnering. Uh, UNC, uh, a Refugee Commission also has uh, a number of uh, innovation projects. So we find projects, areas within the UN where we can actually uh, uh, drive the private sector into uh, into uh, working with us. It's not easy. Uh, there is still very much the, uh, you know, uh, I meet a number of private sector uh, leaders who are very skeptical as to uh, uh, the importance and the work of the UN. Uh, I think my role is to reassure them there are areas of innovations that are uh, important, and I believe that the market is going to be the so there's certainly a, a huge uh, uh, an expanding marketplace. There are emerging markets in areas uh, 20, or 20 years ago uh, were still very uh, behind. Uh, the private sector is everywhere, much more agile and, and flexible. It has expertise and knowledge uh, that the global development community needs. Uh, for example, on the Ebola uh, epidemic, uh, within a week, uh, I had an email uh, with uh, 30 um, uh, Fortune 50 companies wanted to actually uh, be involved and do something about it. Uh, the UN needs to be prepared to face uh, and embrace uh, these, uh, uh, these interests and these commitments. Um, and so we're we're here. The secretariat, the secretary general, definitely is is behind building partnership and strengthening the partnership with the private sector, as well as high net worth individuals like the Bill Gates and the Warren Buffett of the world, because they also are have emerged um, in a in a in a very um, uh, profound way. Uh, again, I think that in the next ten to twenty years. Uh, we'll see, uh, uh, hopefully we'll see a, a private sector and, and, uh, and global community, global development community working together. Uh, I think it's happening in some areas, it's lacking in others. Uh, I continue to convene uh, dialogues with the private sector, um, uh, but I do think that we're in it together. Uh, I don't think we can work in silos and divide it anymore to... Uh, to, to, to change uh, uh, and mitigate some of the uh, global issues. I know we're pressed by time, so a little bit of an overview. Thank you. So in addition to being the moderator, I was also asked to talk a little bit about my vision um, regarding um, how to engage communities, governments, uh, According to my experience in the field, I started working in the field in 98, um, started with a French NGO, then moved to uh, the International Red Cross, and then eventually to the UN with uh, UNICEF and WFP. So I've been 
more field-based than anything for the last 15 years. So maybe I thought I would bring in a little bit of that experience in the field uh, with regard to tonight's topic. And when uh, talking about engagement and thinking about the title of today's dialogue, which is New Actors, New Challenges, um, I also think that some of the challenges are old. It's not only new challenges, we still carry some of the older challenges and some of the older actors as well. And I was thinking of talking about um, local counterparts and my experience in the field working in implementing programs, especially nutrition and food security programs, which was my background. And I realized that still there's a lot to, in my experience, a lot to do and a lot to learn uh, regarding the engagement of, of um, these counterparts. Um, for example, um, I was uh, recently involved in a, in a meta-analysis of nutrition programs across the world from the last five years. So I'm talking about piles of paper that are like this tall, and we had to review all those program evaluations. And one of the most interesting findings from these program evaluations was that in fact, the local counterparts had been minimally part of the program cycle, had been minimally part of um, identifying the programs and uh, building the programs, including local counterparts in the management and leader leadership of the programs. So that was quite surprising, but in a way kind of confirmed what I had seen in, in the field myself. Um, in many coordination meetings, whether it's at local level or regional level, or even at capital level. I mean, yes, local counterparts are invited, but very often, you know, it, they send someone else or they're not fully integrated or in fu fully involved in the, in the meeting. So it's not just about check, we've invited the NGOs, check, we've invited the number three of the local governorate, blah, blah, blah. It's really about having them lead the programs and in my opinion, it's the only way to actually make this sustainable. Otherwise, it's always foreign aid led. And when the money runs out, we come back to the same situation as before. You know, they're left alone and they don't have the capacities and they haven't really developed the momentum and the process to actually lead the process themselves. I was in Haiti, based in Haiti after the earthquake until 2012. And once again, that was my experience there. A lot of money came in, a l you know, people ask me what happened with all that money. Yeah, I mean, it, it costs a lot of money to keep people alive. After an earthquake, you've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in tents. So the money does serve, but how to actually build from that, not only save lives, but actually build from that. And, you know, I think that's one of Haiti's main challenges today which is a lot of money came, but then the money was gone, and they're a little bit better than what they were, maybe after, before the earthquake, but not so much more. But, you know, there were, it was a humanitarian circus. I don't know if any of you were in Haiti during that time period, but it was huge. Um, so the sustainability of the issue is, is, I think, is something that we need to rethink. We've been talking a lot about rethinking new challenges. Well, in, in what I'd like to contribute to tonight's discussion is that some of the challenges are new, yet some of the challenges are old, and we need to also think and build upon the lessons learned from that. So that was uh, my, my, my contribution for tonight. And now, um, as we said before, this is an open discussion. Um, and we'd like to hear you and your questions, your comments, your participation. Maybe to warm up, we could uh, start with a question we've already seen or we've already received via email from Roy Legal. Um, so I'm going to throw it out there, and whoever wants to answer it, it's kind of broad. Um, the question is: What examples of scaled-up success? in sustainable development are we able to showcase today? So what are those success stories, scaled up success stories are we able to talk about today? And what are the elements or conditions that promoted or led to that success? Excellent. So um, you know, I've had several past lives, one of which was at USAID, where I ran public-private partnerships for several years. Um, and I want to talk about two examples um, 
of the of of scaled sustainable um, success or sustain, of sustainable development. I want to um, the first is on uh, youth employment training. Um, there's a great uh, civil society group called uh, the International Youth Foundation, and it is built to work in multi-sector partnerships. And about 15 years ago, it had the idea of partnering with the private sector to bring young people into workplaces in the form of vocational technical internships or trainings in Latin America. And so they, uh, they brought a number of companies, not so much for their for their money, but so much as uh, opening up their workplaces to make available their their training and their expertise and the opportunity to give young people, especially in 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 contexts that where they were disadvantaged, an opportunity to participate in the formal labor economy. And um, AID and uh, the Inter American Development Bank, along with a number of companies in a in a half dozen countries, started this initiative shooting for, I guess, about 5,000 trained young people. Today, it's in the hundreds of thousands of, of young people have been trained in Latin America, and they've brought a number of municipal governments in, in countries like Colombia have picked up on this model and have scaled it up. And so, in some ways, this is an example of where companies bring, it's not necessarily about corporate philanthropy, it's about they, they need young people, and so, I, for example, if you think about the travel, tourism, and hospitality sector, um, there have been some very interesting analyses that they're going to need as many as 70 million newly trained people to meet the challenges of, of the growing travel, tourism, and hospitality sector. And so we talk a lot about youth unemployment, but one of the ways in which we're going to solve the youth unemployment problem is through um, – putting people into making sure that they're qualified to to meet the qualifications that are needed by companies, global companies as well as local companies in the travel, tourism, and hospitality sector. And so this is an example of training donors, multi-sector donors, governments, and the private sector all working together over an extended period of time, 15 years. Uh, and it's now a region-wide and is training hundreds of thousands of young people in, in Latin America. Um, the other... Uh, would be, um, I've seen a number of very interesting supply chain. I think one, another area that I think ties into the issue of the globalization of supply chains. I mean, when you eat chocolate, you know that most of the world's chocolate comes from a handful of countries, uh, such as Ivory Coast and Ghana and, and maybe, maybe a half dozen countries. They don't, chocolate just doesn't come from, you know, from the candy store. It comes from these, and usually, you know, it's, it's grown by smallholder farmers, millions of smallholder farmers. Well, you know, the cacao, there is a, as you do have a growing middle class in places like India or China. Their tastes change. They want to buy chocolate too. And so um, as a result, um, there's an ever-increasing demand, thankfully, for, for cacao. But what's happening is there's a series of public good problems. There's, um, there have been uh, insect problems with uh, in, insect, insect infestations of the of the cacao crop, there have been diseases such as witch's room that have impacted um, the cacao, and as well as there's been uh, new improved um, uh, disease resistant strains of cacao that have been developed by government and the private sector over time. Uh, but what's happened is, is this is to the extent that um, disease or insects impact the um, impact the cacao crop, it means that smallholder farmers are heavily impacted and has all sorts of negative impacts on, on, global, on, the, on, on the rural economies all over Africa that you, one wouldn't think about. So there's actually a, both a, the, it's certainly a cash crop, but there's also certain public good components to it, and there's certain developmental components in terms of making sure that we're plugging smallholder farmers into global supply chains and making sure that they are Increase and, and we want to maximize their agricultural productivity. So, uh, the U.S. government, uh, the World Bank, um, many uh, bilateral donors, along with the cocoa industry, for about 15 years has been working on something called the Sustainable Tree Crops Initiative in West Africa. The Gates Foundation has joined it as well, and it it is training farmers to care for their cacao plants. It's 
uh, working with uh, uh, governments to uh, to create the enabling environment to encourage uh, investment by smallholder farmers to increase their productivity. So it's a combination of science, training, uh, and connecting to markets uh, that, and, and um, again, a multi-stakeholder partnership. So those are two examples. One is youth workforce training in Latin America, and the other one would be around smallholder cacao farmers in Africa. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, we have a microphone that's coming your way. Hi, my name is Contessa Bourbon from the New York Times and London Times. I'd like to ask Ms. Annette about the partnership partnerships with uh, private sector. Aside from health sector, sure. what other areas are where, where there are partnerships between private sector and um, and the UN? Can you cite like a, sure. a specific project for health or education and jobs well, on the on the health i mean there's been a uh, uh, big coalition building over the past since 2007 around maternal newborn and child health uh, through a campaign called every woman every child uh, which rallies uh, hundreds of uh, 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 companies um, and uh, although the goal is one maternal health is one of the uh, uh, MDG goal hasn't been reached. It still has done a tremendous amount of work um, in the area of, you know, uh, mitigating some of the uh, maternal deaths, particularly. Um, uh, the other sector, which is uh, uh, where private partnerships have been, uh, it's it's on the climate uh, climate mitigation. Uh, the uh, our office host uh, a, a big, very big climate risk summit with uh, with Bloomberg, and um, where you see hundreds of uh, uh, you know uh, financiers and bankers and hedge funds and uh, looking at an insurance company and reinsurance company coming. So one area obviously that affects businesses is climate and. You know, the, the Secretary General will be hosting a, a very high-level climate summit on September 23rd. Uh, we're expecting about 800 private sector attendees uh, at the summit, which uh, uh, shows a little bit the, the breadth and, and, uh, of, of the, the issue, and it impacts, really, uh, the marketplace, uh, essentially. Uh, another, I think, area, I'm not sure about education because education, but another area with that has been um, uh, interest, I think, has shown an interest, uh, where the private sector has shown a great interest in is, is, uh, is uh, populations and certainly immigration, you know, uh, um, displaced population, um, and because it also affects, obviously, markets when you have you know, uh, new populations coming on to uh, moving into new countries. Um, I think that um, you know, er issues of uh, very specific health issues like AIDS continue on, uh, on attracting a number of uh, private sector pa partners. Um, I think the uh, certainly on the labor and the capacity building on the ground is an area where the private sector is is obviously uh, very interested to uh, participate and be active. Uh, the area of distribution and supply, uh, supply chain, and an area that is actually uh, I will be uh, working on very closely over the next few months is gender. Um, gender, which is uh, a topic that will be making the SDGs list, um, and, uh, and very happy about that. It is, yes, it is. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, not directly, uh, but gender, uh, women's empowerment, um, uh, violence against women, um, education for all women and girls are uh, areas that I believe the private sector is going to move uh, 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 very aggressively over the next few years. Um, I think Time Magazine was saying, you know, the 21st century is the century of women. And so I think you're going to see a lot of changes in that area. Um, 
That should be the list, right? <laughs> Just to, to add a couple of uh, examples. Uh, it was good the collaboration in the context of the UN, also in the case of reinsertion of ex-combatants with the private sector. So we cooperated in assisting the reinsertion, probably likely in the areas similar to what you meant in uh, um, in rural areas or where they are coming from, and establishing productive uh, activities that had the possibility of uh, uh, getting out of the region. One of the, re the issue of uh, conflict often is that uh, isolated regions that don't have an access to market, they don't have the capacity, the quality. So with our presence, we guaranteed the trust of the both of the private sector and the local population that were inserted and created this uh, synergy that prevent, uh, allowed the, uh, the, the establishment of working activities that provide the livelihood for that one. In that situation, we partnered, for example, with other institutions like the Inter-America Development Bank. They provided infrastructure, but they couldn't, uh, pro the hardware, the software were trained and established an agreement with the local municipality and the population so that this, uh, 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 this uh, infrastructure could be used for, uh, for the population, actually and uh, provide this linkage of often the, the infrastructure without the connection with the local institution and the population cannot uh, be used properly. And another one, just to close, is just uh, uh, still in area that with high, high unemployment and maybe uh, conflict, to shorten the time of unemployment. Often people get uh, unemployed uh, for a given reason and then when they get another employment, it can take even a year. So to be able to establish a system that uh, uh, collect the capacity, provide the skill and the training, and then uh, provide information both from the supply and the demand for concern the employment, then uh, uh, facilitated uh, uh, the, the, the easier, uh, f faster reemployment of, of uh, poor population. And there are other that in this area that can be, but it's actually one of the think that we're experimenting more this cooperation. I don't know whether we are discovering the private sector, discovering us in, uh, or the private sector discovering us in this sense. It's a positive uh, re-encountering. Not to talk about the uh, mining industries. That is the issue is very complicated because it uh, really creates extremely, sometimes conflicted, damaging situations. So the capacity to deal with the, uh, often this, uh, this uh, area are indigenous area. And for the indigenous, for us, a, ch a church is a church. You go in a building and for them is a hill. And the hill is full of uh, uh, rich material. For so there is an issue there where by partnering with, uh, with uh, actors that have a trust of the local population uh, for the negotiation, for the agreements is uh, extremely important. Thank you. Um, would somebody else like to comment, ask? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for to the Instituto Cervantes and the SDG Fund for organizing this uh, very interesting event. I have to, well, first, my name is Tomas Gonzalez. I used to work in the Secretariat and now very recently in UNDP. But these questions come, I think, more from my experience in the Secretariat. Um, uh, the first one. Uh, you mentioned uh, you you give uh, you gave Bruno a superb historical account of how the world has evolved over the last three four decades. And um, one of the questions I think uh, one of the one of the main uh, characteristics of the evolution is I think the fragmentation of the developing world in comparison with how the how developing countries look like like 34 years ago. Um, perhaps this is a difficult question, but that's why you're there. I mean, here I can ask you difficult questions. Um, how how is gonna uh, a new uh, and I agree so once in a generation moment well, maybe twice in a generation after the MDGs, uh, how are these how is the UN and this new development framework going to account for a world that is much more fragmented in which you have countries developing countries that have been very successful and uh, have progressed in many of these uh, indicators in terms of uh, their position in the global economy in terms of exports in terms of social uh, uh, human development indicators while other countries. Uh, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't give names, but you know, let's put the example of Haiti that you mentioned, or, or Mali, or uh, Central African Republic. 
uh, with a, a shock of uh, security uh, nature or of natural nature suddenly uh, find themselves in a situation that uh, is certainly difficult and uh, find uh, their public sector find overwhelmed and they, they suddenly uh, see themselves uh, sliding back to uh, several years uh, uh, before of in terms of human development. I have two questions actually. So this is my first question. Um, how can the UN and how can this new uh, uh, development framework account for, for this much more complex level of reality? And uh, the second one, and this also comes from my previous experience, and perhaps uh, Mr. Huffman can oh, provide some interesting in insights on this. Um, I think that the NDGs, I agree, were extremely successful in galvanizing uh, a common language for, for development, but uh, they certainly were very focused on outcomes. And it seems that now with, incorporate with inclusion of this other dimension of sustainability, security, um, uh, climate change and so, uh, and so forth and so on, uh, it seems that um, there is also an interest in how you get to those outcomes. What What is the process? Not, not being prescriptive, it's not that there is one way, but it's certainly important how you get there in terms of environmental sustainability, in terms of human rights, etc. Uh, that, it seems, would require other people, apart from the UN and governments, working for the same goal. That might include the private sector, but also civil society. Uh, and it seems that it might have to happen at different levels, as if I understand well what you all have been saying. Uh, what role can, can the UN uh, play in terms of uh, creating this sort of uh, variable geometry of partners at the regional level, at the national level? How can we convince civil society that the UN is a relevant place, convince the private sector that the UN is a relevant place, this is a place to go to make things happen and to make sure that we are able to face some of these uh, huge challenges that we have ahead. Sorry for the length. Uh, there was still a second uh, the microphone because this is an important issue for, for and, and, and you can tell the story from your side. Uh, you, you ask a very important question. And actually, it is in direction of what something I hinted at during my presentation, maybe it was not caught properly. Is one one w one of the uh, value add of, of of the UN? Well, one is we have uh, resources for cooperation, which is dwindling uh, and is less important. And I discovered that uh, um, the flag is as important as resources, and what the flag represents. The flag represents a, a a place where you resolve conflict. Uh, because that was created in the UN in, in general. And then you get agreement. So uh, setting up a situation where the UN is perceived as a flag, as a place where you can comfortably go there and express your grievances without being rejected, and at the same time you can listen to others, is a, a extremely important value add. The issue is that uh, you have to have the credibility. And, uh, and that's where the problem. Uh, uh, UN uh, uh, has has to create a modus operandi that uh, uh, is able to create credibility of actors like the FC society, and like indigenous community, like women that are better, and the private sector. Because too often they are uh, disappointed because there is not continuity. There is a uh, erratic uh, uh, attitude of behavior in the UN, and then, then, then you don't go there. So the issue uh, to be able, uh, the, the importance of, of, uh, of that problem, of that, uh, that thing, is critical because it creates a lot of credibility to the UN. But the credibility, you have to gain it, uh, the reputation through consistency, through principle approach, to being capable uh, of uh, getting tough times because of the principle approach, uh, but uh, with understanding and the capacity to be a lot of uh, empathetic. What is what is the others? Uh, what you do bring to the area to be able to to, to solve it? So, uh, so if you think like that, you you the money are less important and the role is uh, more relevant. And when you focus on that, then the money come because once somebody gets a situation that resolves conflict, that is economically relevant. So it <laughs> it gives you some. some. But uh, we are not trained so very much to do that. We are trained to do development, to program, and not to listen and to 
make the other uh, express the capacity to develop that they have, but they have not been empowered. So it's an empowering process as well. Among the sustainable issue, for example, give you an example, again, was uh, a, in a conflictive area. Then it was climate change created conflict between uh, uh, peasant and indigenous community. So we go to the indigenous community to, to create a, a program that we tell them to, to promote sustainability. They, so you are promote, telling me sustainability? I'm telling you what the sustainability is. You get out of here and there will be sustainable everything. So we work okay, but it's not possible the peasants that are not indigenous get, get out. So how would we solve the issue of the conflict between normal peasant and the indigenous community and so on and so forth? And, and they, they have trust you. And, and this is a little issue. And, 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 and when you start uh, promoting participation, you cannot get out of that. You cannot all of a sudden not to continue like that because voice spread around. Okay, well, um, you know, in my engagement with Rio Plus 20 through the major groups, uh, back in 1992 and the, uh, at the UN Conference on, sustain on, on uh, Development, Sustainable Development, uh, the UN and member states created this concept of nine major groups. Nine major groups of what? Nine major groups of society all of whom have a very key and critical role in the achievement of sustainable development. So you have everyone from business and industry, science and technology, you also have children and youth, you have women, you have of course the NGOs, you have local authorities. And I think we really have barely scratched the surface in bringing these major groups of society together uh, to work together on these issues, um, on, on these uh, common goals. So for example, uh, one of the major, I would say, contributions of civil society is bringing the voice of the voiceless to, this, to, to the table. How do you bring those who are actually living in extreme poverty, those who live on $2 or less a day, how do you bring their voices to the table? Not just as intermediaries, in other words, you know, I'm the last person who really is properly equipped uh, to represent the voices of the voiceless. How do you bring those individuals, those communities, those families uh, to the table itself in such a way where there is actually a meaningful conversation between the captains of industry on the one hand and uh, the poorest of the poor on the other? And presumably, a part of this uh, objective is to bring the poorest of the poor to the market so that they can be participate, you know, they, they can be active participants in the market. I mean, one of the ironies of, uh, of uh, economics uh, that I was introduced to many years ago as an undergrad, when I asked my, you know, uh, economics professor, you know, why, you know, what's the definition of a poor person? The definition of a poor person is a person without money. And, and until you have, you know, cash in hand, you're not going to be a participant in, in, in a market economy. And yet that, that, that's our conundrum, is that the market can only go so far in reaching the poorest of the poor. So uh, there are you know, very important roles for the faith-based communities, for example, uh, and for civil society organizations, for social movements to bring um, these communities of the, of the vulnerable into the conversation. Uh, and to the extent that we can work together in partnership with government, with the United Nations, with, with uh, the private sector, and develop those modalities where you had mentioned empathy, where you know, we actually provide space to listen, to actually hear uh, and, and, and uh, understand the concerns um, of those um, who are um, the most vulnerable and discriminated among us. Just to add to this quickly, one thing that I think has changed and I think will continue to transform the UN, and the UN as a membership, uh, is that we see the world now in real time. And we see it very closely. And 
And that changed, I think, a lot of the discussions and the conversations. I, th I don't think that, uh, you know, I think the multi-stakeholders partners look at it, are sensitive to it, respond to it, uh, whether it's genuine or uh, in, the, in the case of the private sector, it comes from their consumer base. Uh, the fact that we can see the world now so up close, I think will change the game. That is a game changer. I think that this, you know, citizen reporting, um, I do think that uh, perhaps countries have challenging uh, public relation issues now. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a new, uh, something has the UN has to face. Technology and communications have changed the way we actually look at the world and the way we participate. Uh, you know, uh, NGOs and the voice, now we can see the poor um, in real time. And, and so the question becomes, if what are we going to do about it? The UN is still the institution in the world that sets these agendas, that drives all of us to, uh, to a better world. It's still very relevant, and that's what I, I, um, you know, I communicate to, to my partners or potential partners, is if you want to be in the global development business, then you need to come to the UN. You need to hear about these issues. You cannot work in silos. If you want to accelerate and 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 uh, you know uh, speed up uh, some of these of, of these uh, these issues need to be mitigated or uh, alleviated, then you need to actually come to the UN and have a discussion. Whether or not you agree is irrelevant, but you need to first hear from the experts and then make a decision whether or not you want to work from. But at least there is a communication effort, uh, there is an educational effort that needs to be made. And so that is, to me, the relevance of the UN. And, uh, you know, the private sector holds the UN in great, and a very noble, it's still very much this kind of ideal world, this, this place where 193 nations come and hopefully uh, agree on, on uh, on, on most of the, 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 the resolutions. Um, it's certainly a place where we, we still haven't had a third world war, right? And so I think we need to kind of remember that as well. Um, but I think the world has changed and uh, will continue to change. And uh, nobody can stay uh, on standby and just, you know, oblivious to what's going on. And, and so the participation will increase and I think we need to, the UN has a role to play in really uh, um, being able to shape and, and provide roles that make sense for these participants and guide them uh, intelligently in a more dynamic way. I mean, in the case of the private sector, the private sector wants innovation and dynamis, you know, and, and energy. And, uh, and it's not necessarily the DNA of the UN, but I think the UN is now also adapting to that changing world. So I think it's kind of, you know, a give and take. Just wanted to say two words on the communication well. I, mentioned, I, I do think that this is part of the challenge that, uh, first of all, I think it's going to be very difficult to make arguments to developed country publics to provide foreign aid to countries that have space exploration programs. So if you're uh, Spain or you are and want to have an aid program in India, or China, it's going to be very, very difficult in the future, even though many of the world's poor live in middle-income countries. I also think um, it is true that there's been incredible amount of development and change in many of these developing countries. My experience has been, uh, to be frank, that many of these middle-income countries like the, the equivalent of the Cadillac Escalade and the Rolex watch of having a, a starter foreign aid program, a sovereign wealth fund, a space program, and saying, you know, stay out of my business. But then when there's an ask for sort of sharing, you know, paying the, the, the collective condo fees of global leadership, then they say, oh, well, you know, we're a really poor country and that's really too hard. So if you're a Brazil and we say we really need your help in Colombia and solving the peace process in Colombia, up to a point they'll participate or, 
or help us, you know, solve a, a problem like Venezuela, you know, there it's not that constructive. And so I think, or you know, I I would argue if you ask some of the middle income countries around China how they're behaving, I think you might get a variety of a spectrum of answers. So I I just would just suggest that um, there are there's been an incredible amount of development, but the willingness to take on sort of burden sharing of global public goods hasn't been there. That's my that's that's a bias and that's an opinion, but it's mine and I'll own it. So, but I also would just say that. Um, I would also say that we've, we've looked at this issue of middle-income countries. I do think it's going to threaten sort of the political rationale to publics and to political leaders in developed countries and sort of the whole rationale sort of the global development industry in terms of saying if you've got countries who have been so successful, it's going to be very hard to sort of – we're going to have to rethink the rationale and we're going to have to understand where are we going to make a difference. At the same time, it's a good thing. We're supposed to be working ourselves out of a job. What we want are countries to look and quack like Spain, which was once an aid recipient and is now a donor. Uh, we don't have, you know, we don't have these sorts of worries about Spain anymore. We don't have these conversations about South Korea anymore. We don't really have these sorts of conversations about Costa Rica anymore. We don't have these conversations about the Baltic states or Poland anymore. These are all aid recipients. 18 of the 20 largest trading partners of the United States uh, are former aid recipients. So it's hard for the aid industry or folks in the development space to sort of, there's always going to be a problem. I mean, there's still poverty in Appalachia in the United States, but we don't have a, people aren't giving us foreign aid to fix our problems in Appalachia or in the inner city here in, in Harlem. So I would just say that um, there's, a, there's some sort of a moment where we're going to have, you know, that we have to rethink our relationship with middle-income countries. They, I, I, I think there's been sort of an imbalance in terms of wanting some of the shiny objects of being a developed country, and but then not sort of paying the global the, the condo fees on global leadership. And then I think we're, we have to worry about the rationale that we've sold to publics about development cooperation when you've had development success, and so we have to rethink what our role is in this changed world. I think there are roles. And there are lots of examples. I mean, we, w the United States reprogrammed the way it engaged with South Korea. I, I want to have a relationship the way we have so, uh, with our relationship with South Korea. It ought, the, our relationship with Brazil ought to be as sophisticated and as, and as enmeshed as we have with South Korea as, as we could have and should have in Brazil. We haven't fully made that transition. Um, and I think, you know, my, exam my view is South Korea is an, a fabulously important stakeholder contributor and responsible stakeholder in the in the, but I don't some of the middle income countries I've referenced I don't think are they'll they'll say oh yes we're the they'll point to certain wonderful and good things that they're doing but the hard stuff I I don't think so I I just like to make a, a, an observation about the role of development um, I mean so far this conversation has been mostly about the role of foreign aid between developed countries and developing countries. But uh, I'd like to ask the question, what is the responsibility, let's say, of a country like the United States to develop its own people? And uh, what is the responsibility of a country like the United States in um, developing uh, a new economic model whereby uh, the private sector is encouraged, for example, to internalize environmental and social costs uh, in a way that it reflects on their company's profit and loss statements. Um, so, for example, um, the private sector has a critical role in changing and challenging unsustainable production processes and influencing consumer habits. We in the United States have, you know, uh, well, I should know these statistics, but uh, we're, what, 12% of the population and 25% of the of, of, of the consumption? I mean, there's, uh, I, I don't know, what, is it 5%, 5%? Yeah, 5% of the population. I mean, the point is, is, as difficult as it may be, and as much as our own publics are often in denial, we need to have these uh, 
conversations within our respective countries. Uh, so I, I think those are the deeper issues that this sustainable development uh, goal agenda seeks to address. And, um, and I think we just need to continue that conversation. So it is, uh, I would agree, it, there is a responsibility of, of uh, countries to each other. But it needs to be a conversation that integrates uh, our policies in, in trade regimes, uh, with our uh, with our policies and other uh, areas of uh, of our economic life. I think that was a very successful question because we obtained a lot of uh, response from it, um, and unfortunately, we've already gone through uh, the time that we were supposed to close, but. Um, uh, we still have the Twitter account I, I was telling you about, uh, hashtag 15i dialogues. Um, there is a website, 15i dialogues.sdgfund.org, in which, in fact, this panel and this discussion will be uploaded and you will be able to watch it tomorrow. Um, so we thank you very much for attending this first um, 59 dialogue. Um, please please feed in into Twitter and uh, send us emails. Let us know what you would like to hear in future 59 dialogues. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed um, this evening and we look forward to seeing you at future, future events like this one. Thank you very much and have a good night.